All right, good afternoon. Uh, just thought I'd do another video. Um, uh, talking about bridge cameras. <clears throat> um, as you can see, I've got a new camera. <laughs> oh dear, another new camera. And I think, oh God. Now, I don't know whether um, not all of you may not particularly remember bridge cameras. Um, they, they used to be, they were called bridge cameras because they kind of uh, bridge the gap between your pocket cameras that don't exist anymore, or they're not produced anymore anyway. Um, and your DLSRs. They didn't really bridge a gap between them. They were still had tiny sensors for the most part. And, um, you know, they, they were shaped like this. They, you know, they were more DLSR to look at rather than uh, actually function like one. So, um, and Fuji made them, Canon, I mean, at one time they were really popular. And to be honest, that's, it's kind of how I got into photography because they were fun things to shoot with. They had these tremendously long zooms um, and they were, they, were, they were fun and I had quite a lot of them. <laughs> I'd started with, I had a couple of Fuji's, I had the Canons, I had a Sony X, HX400, I think it was, something like that. I mean, there was loads of them, they all made them, Nikon, but, um, and then Sony and Panasonic upped the game with these and started putting larger sensors in them, the one inch sensors. And here we have the RX10 Mark IV. This is the fourth variation of the Sony ones. And they started with the Sony RX10, which had a 24 to 200 millimeter lens. And the Mark II had the same. There were some improvements. The Mark III then went to a 600 millimeter lens. And then they produced this one, which is a Mark IV, which also has a 600 millimeter lens. Um, the difference with the Mark III was a 2.8 all the way through the zoom range. Uh, this is a 2.8 to 4, but it has the tracking capabilities of the Sony A, not A1, the Sony A9, you know, one of them. So it is quite capable of tracking subjects, which is really kind of unheard of with bridge cameras because they weren't known for being able to track moving subjects. This kind of broke the mould with that. This is the best bridge camera that was ever produced. And I think it will be the best that was ever produced. Because there's a lot of talk on, I belong to the RX10 forum on Facebook. And there's still talk about people wanting the fifth variation of this camera. And I really don't think we're going to see one. I, I think Sony would have brought it out by now had the, if they were going to... I could be wrong, maybe there is something, but there have been a few rumours about the 5th. Um, there was one doing the rounds only a couple of months ago. Um, but it, it's, it, it, it's never happened. And, and I don't think it's going to happen, in my opinion. I think bridge cameras are now finished. I think the last uh, company to make one was Nikon, the P950. And I mean, these had like 2,000 millimetre lenses on them, but they're tiny sensors, so very limited. Um, they're certainly not, not as good as this. Um, and I think that was in about 2020, I think they produced that. I think this came out in about 2017. I can't remember, I didn't really look it up. But I mean, it's been out quite some time now and it is it is still a worthwhile camera in fact if, you know if, if you could only have one camera then this is the camera you'd have because you know it, it does everything and the image quality is really excellent from this 
camera, you know. Um, it, it's a shame they're not going to bring out a number. Of, I, I, I could be wrong, um, but I don't think I will be. I, I think they would have bought a thing. I don't see them bringing one out because there's no need. This is by far the best bridge camera on the market today. It is still selling today, even all these years later, because it is such a... The image quality is superb. It's got a nice EVF, a tilty screen, the the window at the top here, like the old DLSRs, and like my Nick and Moolas today. Um, and it's good at tracking subjects. You can get fast moving subjects. The tracking's good. The image quality is superb for a small sensor like this. I mean, it really does produce nice sharp photographs. It's just a wonderful all-in-one camera. It, it does everything very well. Um, and as I say, if you could only have one camera, this would be the camera to have. It's quite weighty, but it feels quite solid. It, you know, it's it's nicely built, nicely made, and it is still a popular camera even today. But as I say, I do not think, in my opinion, we will see another variation. I I don't think we're going to see any more bridge cameras. I think they're like pocket cameras. They've gone. They're finished. And I think mirrorless is all there is now. And I think that's all the future will hold. Um, <coughs> that, that's my opinion. I can't see... Um, so I, I don't know why they would want to produce why it would be difficult to make this too much better without making it as good as maybe one of their mirrorless cameras and I don't know that they would do that I don't, I don't know um, I mean I guess they could bring out another version and improve it a bit get, maybe give the um, instead of three uh, like you've got the the um, com the exposure compensation up here on the button, um, and it only goes to three either way. You know, they could make one with a five, or you know, they could improve the video in this. Uh, I guess um, I I don't know what else they could do, but I, I guess they would have to put something. <coughs> excuse me. Um, they could improve it, but I just don't think they will. I think a lot of people would buy the fifth um, version, but I just think because there's no competition for this, and there never has been, no, uh, you know, Panasonic, Panasonic bought out the FZ100, then the FZ2000, or the 2500 if you're in the States. Well, they have to give them different numbers, I don't know, but there you go. And they stopped after that. Panasonic, that was the last one Panasonic produced. And uh, Fuji, Canon and all them stopped producing. They never made one-inch sensors. No, no, they did. Canon did. Um, they did produce one with a one-inch sensor. But it was I did have it. I can't remember what it was called now. Um, and that had a 600mm then. But it wasn't very good. The image quality was, wasn't quite up to scratch on it. And I don't think it proved very popular. Because <clears throat> it didn't have an EVF as well. You had to buy the EVF separately. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, and there could be a couple of others that they've made. I think um, Leica made a couple. Which was similar to the... A bit similar to this. Uh, actually, yeah. If I remember rightly, it was... It may have even had the same sensor. I don't, I don't know, but um, they certainly made one that was similar to this. Um, but, you know, they've kind of all stopped now. They, they've stopped making them. But So where does this fit in with me? Why did I buy this? Because this is the third one I've had. Now, you say, oh, why did I sell them? I sold them before because I had, at the time... I, I wasn't doing a lot of photography. I, I'd lost a bit of interest in it, so I ended up selling them. But obviously the interest has come back again, and that's what happens with hobbies, doesn't it? Sometimes you just get bored of your hobby, and 
you know, it kind of disappears out of your life for a while and then you wake up one day and all of a sudden you're interested in it again. Especially when you've got more than one hobby. And I've got several hobbies, so they do tend to um, come in and out of fashion, if you like, for me at times. So, you know, that's just that's just the way it is. But I was looking, because I've got the Nikon, I've got my macro lens uh, on my Z6 II, I've got the 300 Prime on my Nikon Z7, and then I've got the 150 to 600 on my Sony. Um, so they're all kind of geared towards wildlife and macro, everything. And I've got nothing in between. And I thought, do I get another lens? And I was looking at the Nikon 24 to 120 um, f4, or and I, I really just couldn't find a lens that because I don't really wildlife photography is what I love doing, and I don't really do much else. <clears throat> um, so even if I bought a specific lens like a, a prime, I, I don't know how often I would use it or. You know, I, it's, I thought, what am I going to use it for? And I thought, well, this is the perfect answer because this gives you a 24 to 600 millimetre range. It's going to do everything. I mean, we're going to the zoo next week, with my daughter and my grandkids and that. And I thought, well, I can lug down one of those around with me. But if I've got like a 420 millimetre, then that's going to be great for anything long distance but anything nearer or closer uh, it's not going to be too much useful for but whereas something like this is great for taking as, as a backup camera as a holiday camera um, even if I was going on safari naturally I would take them but this would be a nice backup um, and like for a trip when you just maybe don't want to take something that's bigger and heavier this is, is, you know, it's, it's going to be great for that and it's going to do it all. So this is why I've purchased this because it fits that bridge, if you like, that I'm missing without having to buy another lens that probably isn't going to be as versatile, even no matter what lens I would get. And, and uh, because I'd be swapping lenses, I, I don't really want. I, if there's one thing I hate about um, mirrorless DLS, I was the swapping of lenses. I'd want to just stick a lens on and leave it on there. And that's why I've got more than one camera, so I don't have to keep changing lenses. And uh, uh, to me, that's a bugbear. That is quite a bugbear, but you know, that goes with the territory. But your way around that is to have more than one camera, and that's what, why I've got more than one camera. But this kind of fits nicely into that niche where maybe I can leave them at home and I'll, I'll just take, or I'll take one of them and I'll take this. Um, which would be great because this covers a multitude of things. And you can put a filter on this for some better macro photography. Um, so, you know, it's just such a versatile um, camera. And it's such a lovely camera as well. I mean, it's well made, it's well built. Um, it just, it, you know, if you if you want a, a do it all camera, then this is the best that you can get. Anyway, I thought you know there's plenty of other videos on the OX10 Mark IV, but I just thought I would add to that because I purchased it and why I've purchased it and if you are looking for a one do it all camera then there is no better than this it is the most expensive I got a good deal on this actually but you know if you do look around you can get a decent deal on them they are still quite expensive they're over a thousand pounds I got this for a thousand uh, brand new on eBay so you can get decent deals on them but generally they are over the still about 1500 pounds I think if you bought them from a retailer here in the UK 
uh, brand new. So, you know, look around for a deal is what I would recommend. And you can get them a bit cheaper used. <clears throat> but even used are still quite expensive. It's that good a camera. And it is worth every penny if, if you know, you want to, you, you, you know, there are cheaper alternatives, but if you want the best, then this is the best. Um, so there you go. If you do, you know, get one. If, if you want to do it all camera, this is the one to get. Till the next one. Thank you.